thanks guys and gals and everybody to uh, for attending. So uh, what this webinar really is, I know we're, we're just looking at an hour and I guess I'll just switch between the, the screens as I want them. So NRPP has come up with a, a new certification related to radon and it is a soil gas uh, compliance inspection. Um, just so, just to, to quick intro, Russell Plant Prospective Property Inspections based out of Colorado, Denver area. So this is what we're talking about, the soil gas mitigation compliance inspector. Um, and then what are some of the costs that are related to getting certified? Uh, some available resources that you have as a certified mitigator, inspection, uh, mitigation inspection compliance inspector, um, some of the inspection process, we're not going to get too in-depth. Uh, I don't have a lot of photos to, to show about what you're looking for, what you're not looking for. Uh, that's for you to take on uh, as, as homework or, you know, development of your own business kind of thing, um, but just the general uh, inspection process. And then questions. So please feel free to ask questions. Uh, and I'm going to ask AJ, are you monitoring the questions in chat or am I? Um, I can monitor them for you. Uh, how do you want to take care of that? Do you want me to just interrupt you or do you just want to take them all at the end? Um, what, you can you can interrupt me, especially if it's something pertinent to the, the area that we're talking about. Feel free to interrupt. Uh, that's not a problem. Sure. I'll pop in every time there's a question. Awesome. So soil gas mitigation compliance inspector. Uh, currently, this is only an NRPP certification, so I've not seen anything like this from NRSB. I've not necessarily seen this from InterNACHI and or ASHI, but InterNACHI does have a inspection checklist, and you can get certified from InterNACHI. Uh, it is just different than NRPP certification. So why soil gas mitigation? So ANSI Arst over the last several years has kind of, they, they've had two different systems, two different platforms, if you will. And that those platforms are, um, I, I, my apologies, I'm gonna set my clock so I know how, how long I'm going. Um, but the there's been two separate standards, if you will. One for soil gases, and then another for radon. And they wanted truly to consolidate the different standards into one standard. So there's, believe me, there's a lot of pushback from both radon mitigation companies and soil gas mitigation companies as, as to why they're doing this. And I, I really think they're just doing it to um, consolidate very similar standards. Um, so, Good. My apologies, timer. One hour start. All right. So now um, the, the the there is and there are other gases besides radon that come into a home, and so that's pretty much why they're they're trying to standardize this. Um, and you've got also a certification through the indoor air quality certification too, which do, does cover radon, but it also covers mold, uh, but it's still not uh, the NRPP certification. So I will try to remember to copy and paste these into the chat for everyone. Uh, basically, this is the NACHI document, uh, their checklist, their standards of practice for inspection, inspecting mitigation standards and, and mitigation systems, and then their checklist. And then the NRPP, uh, Basically, this is their online document, if you will, uh, that talks about what a mitigation company has to do, what they should do, what they sh uh, what they shall do, uh, which we'll get into in, in a little bit. So let's first talk about uh, the, the the cost of certification. Uh, AJ, from the poll, uh, how many certified individuals do we have currently for radon testing versus not? Mm, looks like uh, we have 57 participants, four out of seven. 
So they're currently MP, NRPP, NRSB. Sort of okay, so, so four out of seven, that, that's actually a pretty good number. So for those that are not currently NRPP certified, uh, these are some additional costs because part of the soil gas mitigation compliance inspection is that you do have to be uh, a member of ARST. You need to be certified either in mitigation and or testing in order to be a compliance inspector. That's like a prerequisite. So just running through quick costs, you know, you've got a, a probably between 750 and 850 or nine, you've got your RS membership, you've got your uh, independent protocol test, uh, proctored test, which we'll, we'll talk a little bit, uh, a little bit later. Um, that, that was a new platform, which I wasn't used to, and it presented some challenges. Uh, performance testing. You know, I, this is something you have to do every two years. You have to send your devices off to, uh, I, I send them over to Kansas State University and they test it. Uh, in, in some respects, you can think it's a real test. In other, other instances, it's you're, they're testing that you can push a button and read a device. Uh, then you've got your calibration that you need to do annually. You've got your certi certificate maintenance. So you do have to do a certain uh, number of continuing education classes. You got to renew your ARST membership every few years. Uh, and then your again, your performance testing actually is every two years, whether or not you are using the same exact device, uh, which uh, my personal view is if I'm not adding or changing devices, I'm not sure why we have to do a performance test, but that's just the rules. Uh, you've got to have your performance test reevaluated every two years. Now we get into the specific soil gas mitigation certif uh, certification costs. So first of all, you've got to attend the Kansas State University online class. They're the only ones I know of that are giving this. It is $200. It does go towards your CEs for your renewal. So don't forget to register those CEs with both um, InterNACHI because you get, you get credit for them with InterNACHI and you get credit for these uh, classes to your normal uh, testing mitigation and, and testing uh, CE classes. And then you've got your examination. So I'd like to go a little bit into the proctor test at this time. The proctor test is three hours, it's 125 questions, and it is an online, online proctor test, which was a little new to me. So first of all, just if, you, if you're taking notes, they don't support Safari or Mac. Uh, Safari, it's a web-based system. So you can't use that. They don't support tablets such as iPad. Uh, so you have to have either a laptop or a desktop. And one of the interesting things, and I'm gonna change over my screen real quick, just to kind of give you an indication of, of what was going on. Um, they had me do some odd things. They, they wanted me to pick up my computer and show them the room. And in showing them the room, you know, I, I told them I have a 27 inch Mac. I'm, it's kind of hard to pick this up and show you the room. So what I ended up having to do, which is this is kind of the, the, the nuances of it, is I had to take my phone and basically go to the camera and I had to show them my room. I had to make sure that there was nobody in the room, door was closed, and notice that whiteboard in the background? I actually had to wipe my, my whiteboard because they, they basically said that's not allowed. I had to show them my desk, all this stuff. It was a little crazy, but I think that's the new world of online proctored tests. Uh, then you go and take your test, they jump off the screen, and then you are left to your test when they, are monitoring you all in the background. Um, you are allowed to take a break. Obviously, there's no there's no books allowed. Um, uh, that kind of stuff. So you have to have a clean desk, all of that good stuff. So it's it was definitely a different experience for me. I've taken proctored tests, but usually it was at a site 
uh, where the person just physically monitors you. Uh, so this was definitely a different experience for me. So back to, I'm gonna go ahead and play this. Get back my, my clock. So these are just basically the costs of just this particular certification. So now we'll get into a little bit of the inspection process. We're gonna talk a little bit about shell versus should. And it's pretty interesting that the entire document, which I'm gonna bring up on the screen here in a little bit, uh, there are these two key words, which they really focus on during the training a mitigator shall, which is a requirement. They must do these things versus should, it's recommended. And the instances of these, uh, you know, you would think some things should be should and versus shall, but that's just kind of the way they, they word it. Um, this depends on the mitigator versus the inspection point of, inspector point of view. Um, and I'll give you a good example. A, should, or rather correction, a shale requirement is that they shall seal all the cracks in the basement floor. So if it's concrete floor and it's exposed, unfinished, they shall seal cracks. Well, I did an inspection where the mitigation system was not compliant according to these guidelines, brand new install. The basement had cracks in the slab both in the expansion joints and other areas, and they weren't sealed. I didn't make too big of a deal out of it to my client because basically the seller had belongings everywhere. They had a workout area, they had stored belongings, just junk. I'm mean, just personal belongings, not junk, personal belongings all over the place. I can't imagine that a mitigator is going to take on the responsibility of moving these things so that they can seal these cracks. I don't think the homeowner cared to move these things just to be compliant with mitigation system. So one of the things I advised my client is prior to moving in, have somebody come in and seal the cracks. It's not a big deal. It's, it's caulk and it's sealing of, of these cracks, which kind of gets to that third item is that and agreed upon terms. One of the interesting things I learned in this class was that there is no stipulation in the ANSI ARST um, book, the manual, the, the um, requirements, to get a house below 4.0 picocuries per liter. Even though that's what the EPA recommends, there's no requirement to get it below. It's really goes back to the agreed to terms. You have a 2,000 square foot house with a regular basement, no big deal, sump pit, easy for a mitigator to get that below 4.0. There's no real concerns there. However, now you have a 10,000 square foot house with a dividing uh, slab, and, and now you have one half of the house that they can get below four, but the other half of the house is above because of various reasons where they would have to add two separate mitigation ex extraction points or, or uh, penetrations. And the seller or the owner doesn't want to do that. They don't want to go to the extra expense. They're willing to live with six picocuries per liter. That's an agreed upon term between the mitigator and the client, not necessarily a defect in the system. So that's where uh, that agreed upon terms, it really kind of uh, plays a role in not, as, not assuming, you can call the cracks out. I, I do all the time, cracks, it's not installed according to standards. Let them, let the, the buyer and the seller figure that out. That's above our uh, pay grade, if you will. Um, going kind of fast here. Uh, Hopefully there's some, some questions, but I do wanna get into the ARST radon mitigation application demo. So as part of the training from Kansas State, 
uh, university there, they will send you a link. You tell them I have an iPhone or an Android, they'll send you a link to download the app. I do believe it is registered to you as the individual. So I'm gonna just go ahead and, and open up this app and share this app and just to give you an indication of what that looks like. So here is the Arst uh, application, basically. And we've got a submitted review or a PDF, and I'm gonna create a inspection report. So homeowner, I'm just gonna use, I, I do have a mitigation system. I'm not gonna be taking real photos. Sorry. So I'm creating the report. These are all of the items that should <clears throat> Sorry. So these are this is the app you fill out the information you have you can it requires a photo of various you know, homes or, or whatever. It wants to know sub slab. <coughs> oh, sorry, folks. <clears throat> you have to define whether or not it is a sub slab depressurization, <clears throat> whether the home has been tested. Mit mitigation installers information. <clears throat> hey Russell, we got a question from Chad Smith. He wants to know, um, yeah. important to note, or he's saying important to note that this inspection <laughs> is the current ANSI ARST standards. Many older systems won't meet current absolutely no that that's a good point and that's not what we are actually inspecting with this certification um this is for systems installed 2017 and, and newer so this is not older systems and i don't know about the rest of the inspectors on whether or not you actually inspect or comment on current existing mitigation systems. Uh, if they're older than 2017, I still comment that they're not current, they're not to current standards, because that lets them know that if a significant change needs to be done outside of just replacing a fan or replacing a manometer, you know, basic maintenance items, that they would have to bring it to current standards. Uh, if it is obvious things like not venting above the eave, then I will state this should be vented above the eave. Um, but nothing's requiring them to to make those changes. This certification and standard truly is from 2017 going forward. Hopefully that answers Chad, Chad's question. Um, Trying to think of see whatever oh, street address. Um, going through, so that's the general information system. They they want a picture of the label. Uh, believe it or not, as simple as this might be, the the standard requires the label to be completely filled out, not partially filled out, completely filled out. Uh, and then just whether or not the monitor is, is there. And, and again, I'm not gonna get too in depth into this app. I'm just kind of showing you what this, this is. All of us can take this exact information, 
not be certified through NRPP for this process. You can put this into your own reporting software. Uh, this isn't rocket science, if you will. Um, so you don't have to use this software, in my opinion. I think if you are certified and you are doing a NRPP based certification slash inspection, I think they want you to use this app because I also think it gives them, this information goes to them so they have some data. I don't know if it extracts client information or not. And I also truly don't know if this actually goes to them. Uh, but they, they want you to fill all this information out and you really can't continue. You have to answer each one in order and fill out the, the uh, photos. It will not let you save unless you have completed all of these items. So anything that has the asterisk on it, upload photo of ADS fan, you've got to have that photo or else it won't let you save. So here's an example of a completed report. And this is just me doing quick little inspection, whether or not it was compliant, photo of the house, photo of the manometer. Pretty simple. Again, I think any of us could replicate this in our own individual software. I, I have in mind, um, So, so this would not be currently to standard, but this was installed in 2000. You're not allowed to have it plugged in like that. So that's pretty much the report in and of itself. Pretty, pretty clear cut app. Uh, why recreate the wheel if, if you don't have to? So now we, I talked a little bit about the, the document, the uh, ANSI, ANSI document. So I'm going to pull this out and, and we're going we're gonna to go through this a little bit. This is absolutely free to everybody. There, there is no, uh, no restriction on, on this document. And so if you want to forego necessarily the cert certification, especially if you're in a non-licensed uh, state, well, you don't have to be certified in this if you don't have to be certified in, in testing. And I will say, I mean, being in Colorado, we are a licensed state. However, the state does not recognize this particular certification. So it really doesn't do me any real good. Well, I think it will, because I'm going to make it good, and we're going to talk about that. But uh, this is the document, and it's free to everybody. And so easily enough, you can go through it and read it. This is all the information that they test you on. Uh, it is a searchable document. So you can easily search the word shall and what that, they even define what they mean by shall. The client shall be informed. I'm not sure why anybody would not inform a client, but. And getting into the actual inspection that, you know, you're not going to be inspecting the design you're going to get into the meat and the potatoes of the document, whereas defining what that suction point is, you know, having photos of that. This is probably the, the, the bigger one, the labels are required, you know, and, and where are they required? Either 10 foot vertical or is it 10 feet vertical and, and 10 feet horizontal if it's visible. It's not visible. Obviously, the not ha having it labeled is not going to help you. Um, so basically, what I did for my own software, and again, this is outside of a compliance inspection. When I do a property inspection, I notice that they have a radon system. I'm inspecting. 
especially if I'm doing a radon test, just to see if there's any glaring um, outstanding items. Uh, I'm not too worried about the labeling. I, I know not labeled properly. All right, it's it's a light note. Um, it's not vented above the eave. It's vented below the eave. I make a little more note of that just because that can cause mold and mildew under the eave. Uh, I've seen that a, a few times. Uh, but I take basically the, the verbiage right out of here and, and added it to my my own inspection reporting software. Why Why recreate the wheel? So I'm going to share the next, or go back to the, the presentation. So I, I went over a little bit of the, the specific, you know, inspection process from that, that's using that software. So we're all, we are all, or most of us are InterNACHI members. Uh, the, the first column is InterNACHI, the second column is NRPP. This checklist really is a right out of InterNACHI's book. Uh, I actually did not take this list of items from NRPP because they're so similar. You, you have all of the tools to inspect a mitigation system, regardless of certification from NRPP, to do an accurate inspection. And you know, we're supposed to describe the system. We're supposed to note that the piping supports are, are proper. You know, and this gets back to, I believe his name was Chad. You know, the, the proper piping supports used to be, I think, 10 feet. Now they're six or four, Some, you know. So there's, there's changes that older systems are not going to meet. You know, I, I would not be making that big of a deal out of it. You know, unless the manometer looks broken because it's so old, has no fluid in it anymore. Um, you can point things like that out. Uh, you know, we, we're supposed to identify the point of discharge and, and a big change um, in the, the point of discharge that did come about as of 2017 is discharging on the outside of a wall. So in, in Denver, we have a lot of basically four-story townhomes, and you just can't run a radon discharge up four stories. And then if you do, you're ejecting it above the, the roof, but that roof happens to be a, 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 a rooftop deck where people are partying or, or you know sitting out and lounging. So now you're discharging radon right where they're sitting. So you can now discharge below roof level, uh, but you have to test in the room that it discharges next to. There's some other requirements. That's that's a recent change, uh, but it's got to be above 10 feet. Both InterNACHI and NRPP want you to look at for the, for the same thing. Uh, is the fan you know in an in and under conditioned space? You know, which is which is not allowed, never has been allowed. That shouldn't be the case any at any point. Sealing, uh, the inspector should look for sump pits being sealed, cracks being sealed. Uh, the the ejection pipe, if it's outside, uh, a lot of and one of the allowed uh, discharged piping, they are allowed to use um, four inch. Downspouts. If an HOA doesn't want to see a, a round pipe for some reason, uh, so you are allowed you are allowed to use downspouts, but they still have to be properly sealed. Uh, I've met I've seen many times where that transition between PVC and the downspout is not sealed, and so right there, next to a window or a door, uh, it's it's pumping out air, pumping out radon or whatever soil gases are. Uh, so it's not making it to the ejection point. Um, we should be looking for the uh, electrical, uh, the drain pipes, if there's condensation, uh, if you're in a cold weather area, or whether or not it has or needs uh, um, insulation, 
sometimes you've got some, and, and there was a recent uh, thread about freezing, fans freezing because the condensation would flow back down into the tube because it wasn't properly insulated in colder environments. We don't typically have that problem in Colorado, but uh, we do run across sump pumps and everything else not being properly sealed. Um, whether or not it's, it's labeled. Well, I think that's a duplicate. So selling this service. Uh, when I first thought about getting this certification and I wanted to know how to basically, you know, pass this on and, and actually sell it as a service, I actually asked uh, probably about 15, 20 realtors, when you have a buyer and the radon comes back high, what's your default go-to? What is your default uh, ask? And most of them stated, well, we want a mitigation system. And that's where they stopped. And I took on the part of educating them, for one, saying, well, you really should not only ask for a mitigation system, but a positive test that it is below four, or at least at an acceptable level to the buyer, to your client. Again, they might get the feedback from the seller saying, it's going to be, we, we paid $4,000 for the system and it didn't do the job or $2,000 for the system, didn't do the job. We don't want to pay another for, we got it from 15 to six or five, you know, or, or, or three point, you know, 4.1, whatever it is. Um, but that's helping educate your realtor network. So reach out to your realtor network and say, ask them, what's your go-to verbiage when you're asking for a radon mitigation system? And then you can tack on that you would recommend having this verbiage, which is basically, I'm asking for a radon mitigation system I want it inspected by a radon mitigation compliance inspector. And I don't, I'm not saying NRPP, I'm not saying Internachi. It, in my opinion, it can be either or, uh, because if you're certified for inspecting mitigation systems through Internachi or NRPP, that's your choice. You sell it to them. Uh, and then, then what I do, is an, another benefit. And I think we all know this happens all the time. Company does, the seller comes in, they, they get the lowest bid, they have a mitigation system put in. The mitigation company is gonna leave, most of them in this area, a charcoal test behind. And I wanna say in the last five years, I've seen six mitigation system where that charcoal system is still there years later, never had been tested. The post mitigation test was never processed by either the seller or the buyer. Uh, and then they wonder why the mitigation system came back at still at 11 picocuries. So what I tell my realtor network and what I help educate them on is ask for the mitigation system and a compliance inspection and a post mitigation test of the levels. I offer that mitigation system inspection and post-test, again, we're licensed here in Colorado. I don't have to be licensed to do the mitigation inspection, but I do to do the test. I do have to be certified to do the test. But I sell that as a bundle where I'll do the inspection and I'll do the, the post-mitigation test. And I'm not going to change my inspection process. So that example I gave earlier where the seller put a mitigation system in, didn't want to move his belongings around so that the mitigator could properly seal the, the basement slab, my recommendation is going to be the same. Yeah, they didn't do it. I get that. We all get that. It's a lot of work to move stuff over here, then over there. Yeah. Just just have it just have it sealed when they move out. You know, that's that's a that's an easy low-hanging fruit, no pressure uh, fix in, in my opinion. So use your current knowledge, pictures, promote yourself to your network group, your realtor groups. Uh, we have a, a, a several realtor groups in, in the Denver area. Post up on their websites. When you find something that's of defect that you recommend is, is 
needing of repair, post that up there, put a video up there of yourself saying, hey, I'm a certified mitigation inspector through NRPP. And uh, I came across this at an inspection. Uh, you've got a fan that's below or underneath living space. This is not allowed. And it was installed two years ago. Uh, so so that's a, a easy way to promote yourself that this is why we do post mitigation inspections and just kind of sell, teach and promote. You do that and you'll start to get traction on something like this service. It is completely an ancillary service, uh, no, you know, very much like radon testing. And I don't know how much more time we have, but we can open it up to, oh, well, shoot. I'm, I'm only 30, 30 minutes in. So we definitely have time for lots of questions and discussions. I don't know if you can open the audio or not, but. Uh, currently, attendees can only just type in their questions in the chat or <laughs> question box. Yeah, so we just have the one question from Chad. And here's uh, the Q&A. So nothing in the Q&A. I'm gonna look at my notes and okay. see if there's something I missed. I will say that that proctored test was a new new one on me. That was a little frustrating. Uh, I've got a question from Sean. What other soil gases other than radon should be we, we'd be aware of? I actually did take some notes on that. Um, there, there's you can have methane uh, in uh, in your soil, especially if you are close to or over a a, a brown site. Um, you can have methane gases. Let me pull that. Yeah, so radon is is the most talked about, but you can have methane from decomposing matter from landfills if you're too close to them to them, a brown sites hydrocarbons. Uh, I actually, this kind of gets back to a the radon, but uh, had a radon test came back at 52 picocuries per liter. The buyer did a research and found out that there was a radium ore processing plant within a mile or two of his home. And they were probably just dumping the, the tailings you know, back before the EPA prevented them from doing that kind of stuff um, in, into the ground. You can also have hydrocarbon fuels if it was an old or near a old fuel tank that was leaking uh, and didn't get fully decontaminated. Uh, a lot of other VOCs, uh, pesticides, overuse of pesticides that seep into the ground can come back up through and into the the air in your house. So th there definitely are other soil gases, not just radon, um, to be concerned about in some cases. We also have another question from Dale Witt. If I'm using a home gauge, is there somewhere in here that the InterNACHI checklist can be used? So you would have to build it in home gauge, uh, but I would definitely open up that a checklist from InterNACHI and just if you already have a radon tab, I know in my template with my software, I actually have a radon uh, tab as part of my uh, plumbing subsections. And that's where I put things I point out. That's where I took InterNACHI's slash ANSI ARST's uh, verbiage and added it to, right, directly to my template, cut and pasted in most cases. Uh, yeah, and I say most cases, I generalized like the labeling. I want to say there's probably 20 subsections of the labeling. I just took the top label and said, labeling not, you know, labeling of the system is, is improper, pasted it in there. Not our job to point out exactly um, the, the 
the nitty gritty, if you will, you know, it's not labeled properly. I, I, I'll put a photo of what's not labeled or if it's the, the piping vertical or, or standard, um, you know, I, I will put that it's not labeled, you know, general, a general photo. Um, and I, I do have a funny story, if you will. And I think this happened here in Colorado. Um, it was a passive radon system, was not labeled. The owner of the house wanted to put in a bathroom, thought that the tube was a drain tube, and pumped, piped in a toilet into his radon system. Needless to say, that was not a happy outcome. They had high radon levels and a mess to clean up. Did that answer your question, Dale? So I'm going through. Oh, uh, well, let me pull open and share just real quick uh, the InterNACHI's uh, standards here. Resources. So very similar. This is the InterNACHI checklist, if you will. Very, very similar to the, the ARST ANSI NRPP certification. You can take a lot of this and, and put it right into your template, uh, cut and paste, simple modifications for your style. I mean, and you can see it's all of 10 pages. Um, yeah, pull, pulled a lot of this right out of InterNACHI's. And of course, because it's an ARST ANSI standard, they get into a lot more detail of, you know, whether or not this mechanism monitoring shall be labeled. Um, you, technically, according to ANSI ARST, right down to the circuit breaker that supplies power to the radon mitigation fan is supposed to be labeled in the panel. The uh, barrier if it's crawl space if, if you if you have a split level home and you inspect the basement if you're going into the crawl space and they have a mitigation system that barrier as you are crawling in is supposed to be labeled and then they really want contractors and anybody else to know that this is a integrated system if you damage it please you know either fix it or um, let somebody know that that there's cuts in the, the vapor barrier and it needs to be fixed, but that vapor barrier is supposed to be labeled. They, they really want labeling of any and all parts of, of a radon mitigation system. And then here's a, if, if you're just doing a mitigation inspection checklist, here's a default InterNACHI checklist pre-made for you. You can take this and, and Easily put this into whatever inspection software you have and start offering compliance inspections. So Chad said another important aspect of NRPP and licensing is overlooking the quality control program. And I'm assuming you are talking about the uh, testing quality control program. Is that correct, Chad? Um, and, and I'm going to go for, yeah, so he, he said yes. Uh, absolutely. The quality control program is there. It's, it seems a bit overkill, but that's just, you know, beside the point. Those are the requirements. And it's, you could ignore it if you want until somebody says this, this isn't done right. Uh, a, there was a, a, an inspection, again, this, I know this was in Colorado, a testing company uh, inspector basically placed a radon test on top of a register, a heating register. And a peer inspector 
who was on the listing side heard of this because the realtor asked for his input. And the funny thing was, was the seller happens to be a scientist and happens to know about radon and is familiar with the radon testing protocol. And so he knew that this was an improper testing procedure. Radon came back very high. He's like, all bets off. This wasn't even remotely tested properly. Uh, and that's not answering Chad's question specifically, but your quality control program is important. Don't ignore it. If, if you're using a passive test like an EPIRM, do your blanks, do your spikes, um, and, and by all means, get your devices calibrated. And that goes for CRMs or uh, your um, EPIRM e e devices, whatever device you're using, go ahead and get it calibrated. Those are all part of your Q QAs. Uh, and have, and this is probably one of the more overlooked parts of your quality control program. You've got to have it documented. So if you have a procedure where you place the radon test, you take a picture of it, where it was located, that becomes part of your report. Whether or not it becomes part of your report, keep it with your data, but have your quality control program documented. Even more important, if you have a multi-inspector firm where you have one person placing it, another person picking it up, or uh, going through, uh, for example, for the testing, and uh, this is outside of the mitigation inspection, knowing that the person placing, if it's you or somebody else, actually went through and looked at all the windows and make sure that there was closed door conditions. Uh, and, and then document it if there wasn't. So did, did that answer your question, Chad? We do have another question from Sean. Uh, with a radon mitigation system inspection, do you always do a post-radon test to verify the acceptable levels? That's part of the standard. That is absolutely part of the standard. A post mitigation test is part of the requirements. So um, that, uh, that is required. But it's interesting because even Colorado, we're, we're licensed, we're, we are required to be certified. There's no requirement that extends to the seller. So if the seller's not told they have to do a post mitigation test, they they're they're not responsible they're not liable uh the most of the inspection or the the mitigation companies in our area leave a test behind i'm i'm hoping that they tell them yeah do a test uh, but i know we've had instances here where as i mentioned i've done tests where the radon was 11 or 12 i think and the mitigation test was still sitting there never never was completed so the person who paid for that mitigation system threw their money away because they had no idea that the mitigation company didn't get didn't do the job you know and and it's it's not even it, it would be one thing if they did the test it came back still high and they went to their their mitigator saying what what gives oh well you've got X, Y, Z factors, you know, it's, it's a 14,000 square foot home. Yeah. Yeah. We have to do extra stuff. Um, but this was not, uh, that case. It was a normal house split level. Um, but the, I, I believe the crawl space, no, I think the crawl space in that one was properly mitigated or was part of the mitigation, but it still wasn't meeting their, the levels. So meeting the levels is one thing, Having never done a post mitigation test is is completely another, which I think that's why and and a good selling point that you can tell your realtors that again you're protecting their client. If they don't do a mitigation test, they have no idea what that cost or what that expense was, uh, and whether or not it was worth the money. Because if it's not doing the job, then what was what did they pay for?
So I would always recommend a post mitigation test. And another thing I will bring up about testing in, in our area, uh, again, I, I'm sure I'm hopefully, hopefully we're from all over the country, but in Colorado, we have a lot of swamp coolers. And I will advise my clients to not do a rate on test with me, a short-term rate on test in the middle of the summer when all they have is a swamp cooler for cooling because, and it's occupied. So that's, that's the stipulation. If the house is occupied, they only have a swamp cooler and it's the heat of the summer. Uh, I don't recommend my clients do a, a mitigate uh, a rate on test because I can't expect persons living in a house with just a swamp cooler for cooling to adhere to closed door conditions. So the test isn't gonna be valid anyways. So I recommend a, a long-term test after uh, they take ownership. You know, radon test mitigation systems aren't the huge scare, cost scare that they used to be in, in, in my professional opinion. Um, I don't know if Dallas, uh, Dallas uh, did anybody attend Dallas Jones's uh, webinar and, and always be ready. The, we talked about always be ready. If, if you're doing an inspection and they don't want to, you know, they said they don't want to uh, test, have one with you. You know, always, always have one with you. So before I get too far, I want to post into the chat uh, some of these websites for you guys. Oh, that's, I, I hear, and I'm going to say realtors, I'm going to say realtors. I hear them throw out numbers 750 to 1500 all the time. Now, whether or not that's accurate, um, Given inflation and material costs nowadays, I don't know if that's still accurate. That's just a number uh, I hear thrown out. Uh, like most of inspectors, I don't I don't quote prices. I don't I don't care if I know them. So um, let me go ahead and pull open. We got another question from Sean. What is the average price for a retrofit mitigation system? Yeah, I, I think I, I kind of just spoke to that. Uh, you know, I hear realtors all the time throw out uh, 750 to 1500 and that's going to be this area. I have no idea what they are in, in Pennsylvania or other parts of the country, um, but that is kind of uh, a common range I hear, uh, but it's also based on the house. You know, a, a house like mine, which is 1961 uh, slab basement, I, I could see 750 to, a, to a 1200. You know, you, you core a hole, you, you pipe it outside, but once you have a split level and you've got to put in vapor barrier, and oh, by the way, you've got to clean out all of the belongings in the crawl space first before you can ever put down a vapor barrier. Um, you know, that all throws various costs into the, the realm of things that I, I just don't get into the quoting process. I'll let, let the realtors quote that stuff. So I'm, I'm throwing up into the chat some links uh, that are related to the InterNACI checklist, their standards of practice, the ARST, uh, NRPP standards of practice, and, and the soil mitigation, that document that I, I sh I'm sharing with you, uh, so you can access that. <clears throat> I don't think there's other...
if that one doesn't work, I've got a slightly different one. Uh, and this is the, the soil gas mitigation. That's the one I use to, to demo it. Any, any other, anybody else have ideas on how they could maybe sell this ancillary service? And, and one of the other things I do, uh, oh, uh, so AJ, when I'm posting, it says, oh, you know what? How about to every? You see, you see where it's at? It, yeah, it says host and panelists. It doesn't say, and then I see AJ. I don't see everyone. Uh, here, I'll, I'll repost it for everybody. Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, one of the things I do, again, we, we've got a realtor, a pretty large realtor uh, board, if you will, uh, South Metro Denver area. And because I'm a certified radon testing individual, I actually do a two hour CE course for realtors. It's, it's, a, it's an accredited CE in the state of Colorado. And so I, I give that class for free. And one thing I want to point out for you as a benefit, because if you do outreach and education, that goes towards your CE credits to renew your certification. So make sure you're, if you're doing any education, note and document that because you get credit for your CE classes, uh, both from ARST, NRPP, and InterNACHI. Uh, so add those both to the, th this class right here, this webinar right here, put this in as an hour for continuing education, uh, if, especially if you're struggling to get your, your CEs done in a year, uh, all of this stuff counts. So don't, don't let it go to waste. So that pretty much is our hour. Do we have any last minute questions? Thank you, AJ, for reposting that and, and also for uh, doing a great job coordinating this, getting this out to everybody. Does this count for the states? Uh, well, I'm, Dale, uh, it says, does, does it count for the states? You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to say, I don't know what state you're in. Um, the state of Colorado basically relies on my certification through NRPP. So it would count for NRPP's credits and CEs and therefore back end into the state. As long as you maintain your certification uh, with NRPP, the state of Colorado uh, acknowledges that. Hopefully that answers Dale's question. So uh, Chad mentioned, I sell testing and soil gas compliance inspections to mitigators, gives them credibility. Uh, and that, that absolutely can, uh, would love more information on exactly if you're willing to share. On, on how you are doing that. Um, I, I kind of, I, I would like to sell my radon testing to other inspectors because I know that the, there are, now that Colorado's a licensed state, there are some inspection companies that just backed away from doing radon tests. Um, and I would sell, you know, radon testing to them, but there's, quite a few inspectors that don't want another inspection company showing up, even if I'm there just to drop a radon off and I leave and, you know, um, you know, that, that's a, you know, they see it as a, as a potential conflict. Um, but uh, I, I'm wondering if, if mitigators would do the same thing was my view, why I would really lean more towards the realtors versus the mitigators. But if, if you can sell it to mitigators, I think everybody would love a little more insight on on how that's going for you, and uh, what's your what's your approach. So 
So Chad uh, mentioned uh, many mitigators don't want to do testing because of the additional requirements. Having a third party inspector inspect the install is also seen as a benefit. Uh, and, and I would agree. Um, ho hopefully they they see it that way too. <clears throat> so I'm not against that. And I, and I think I was looking to do that, but I was just uh, leaning more towards educating the realtors uh, on that. Uh, and I know they don't want to do testing because all they do is they leave behind uh, the, that test kit for the sellers to do it. You're right. The legitimate ones do. They they absolutely do. Um, and and I don't know where, what state you're in. I hear in Colorado, it's a pretty cutthroat industry. They uh, they they underbid each other. They steal each other employees. No nobody gets along. Even though there's probably plenty of work for all of them. Oh, you see, you're in Colorado Springs. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And I would agree. The, the legitimate ones do. Uh, anonymous attendee says, will we receive something to show that we've attended this webinar for CE hours? Uh, and I'm going to assume this is a internachi question. question. And I'm going to say no, I don't, unless AJ, you correct me, if, if you get, uh, if you send something out for attendance, I think it's an honor system. I, I really do. You attended it. Uh, it's no different than meet than meeting at a um, uh, chapter meeting once a month. It, it's up to you to be on the honor system and, and just say, yeah, I attended this meeting and or this webinar. Um, now, other other platforms like uh, my my tests and my class I took for Colorado State, you get a certificate from those. You never have to submit it. I've never submitted a certificate. InterNACHI has never asked me for one. Uh, NRPP does. They want to, you to submit your cert certificates of classes you took. Um, but InterNACHI is very much an honor system. Has been for years, which I appreciate. All right, folks, uh, you know, our, our, our hour is there. If you have additional questions, uh, I, reach out to me through either the forum or uh, uh, the, you know, directly, uh, Russell at Prospective Property Inspections. Be willing to help uh, and, and mentor whatever, whatever I can do to help everybody out. Thank you, everyone.